there, Kazen here, and welcome back to Always Doing. I am here with the rest of my 1K Q&A. Today I'll be talking about more personal stuff, about reading stuff. There's gonna be a little bit of Japan thrown in as well. And I have all of your comments written here. This time we're just gonna go a bit more random. Let's get right into it. First, from Rachel at Kalanadi. I'm going to be that person who asks the personal questions that you can completely not answer if stuff's private. No worries! How old are you? I'm 36. What is your family like, parents, siblings, etc., and how do you keep in touch? So I have a younger brother and my parents, and so that's who it was growing up. And my mom is really the like linchpin for a lot of the communication. She's the one that I'm most in contact with via email, and we have phone calls on the regular, and she passes stuff along to my dad, who's not quite as technologically there as my mom. And my brother I communicate with via email, but we're not big on phone calls or anything. And her last question is, and what are your favorite Japanese dishes or foods that you just can't seem to enjoy? Uh, I think a lot of people, if you think of Japanese food, the first thing that comes to mind is sushi, and I like sushi, but it's not really my favorite. I like more of the home cooking type stuff. A lot of the rice bowls, stuff over rice, I'm a huge fan. Whether it's gyudon, which is uh, beef over rice, or oyakodon, which is kind of funny because oyako means mother and child. So oyakodon is chicken and egg over rice. I love some really good soba, especially the cold soba noodles. Those are just, oh, so good. And just random, I mean, sweets and, you know, the rest of it. But as far as food goes, those are probably some of my favorite things to eat. As far as foods that I do not like, I do not like wasabi. I do not get along with it well. So when we go out to get sushi, um, I order everything without wasabi, which is something that a five-year-old would do. So it's sort of embarrassing, and people tell me that sushi doesn't taste right unless you have wasabi, but whatever. It just goes like straight to my nose, and it's not fun. I also don't like natto, which is fermented soybeans, and they are like sticky, and they got like strings between them, and they smell to high heaven, and it's kind of like uh, cilantro. You either love them or you hate them, and I'm on the hate them side. Allison Rose asks, how have your reading tastes changed over the years? Have you always liked the kinds of books you do now, or have you found that you've become more drawn to different genres or stories now than you were at a younger age? And relatedly, Cynthia over at Book Whimsy asks, Do you remember what book got you into romance? You read so widely, can you talk about how your taste in reading has developed? My tastes have definitely changed over the years. One constant has been fantasy, whether it be more of a fabulous thing. Like, I remember even elementary school, there was a book called The Chocolate Touch, which was kind of like the Midas touch, except the kid turned everything he touched into chocolate instead. And uh, the Redwall series uh, by Brian Jacques, I loved that. I think that's the author. And then, you know, His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. So if anything, there's been that through line of fantasy. In high school, I went through a classics binge. One of my teachers gave us a list and it was like, 50 or 100 books that everyone should read before college kind of list, and I've spent time going through that. I found some wonderful books that way. Winesburg, Ohio, for example, I really enjoyed. But then I went to university, and just the amount that I had to read for my classes and for my major was so overwhelming that I didn't read very much for pleasure anymore. Sometimes in the summer I would get on a binge, and that's when I was first introduced to urban fantasy, which I ended up loving, and it was the Anita Blake series which starts in urban fantasy and then goes into romance, like paranormal romance, and then goes into erotic what the hell. But I enjoyed watching it go down that slide, and that introduced me to romance in general and other books and series that I didn't know existed. While my fiction taste has changed, nonfiction has been fairly constant. I've always enjoyed reading, reading about science and other things, so that doesn't feel like as much as a shift. Heidi from My Reading Life asks, where would you recommend English readers start with manga? And, oh boy, I'm not so sure. If you happen to watch an anime, or if you know that you like a particular anime, see if there's a manga that goes with it, and if it's been translated, it probably has. That would be a great place to start. And as far as for stuff that I know is translated into English, I'm not so sure exactly I can say that here is a great series. If you want something that's both light and dark and also has a bit of slice of life in Japan, I really love Fruits Basket and that's also, and anime has been rebooted, so that's going on right now. Another easy to recommend shoujo is Boys Over Flowers, Hanayori Dango. This also has 
I, there's an anime, there's several live action series. I think one is Japanese, I think it's been done in Korean as well. So you know it's a good start you. So many people have adapted it. But I'm so sorry that I don't have like a go-to series that like I think most people would enjoy. I'm just not so widely read, not so sure. But libraries now are really good, at least from what I understand about stocking manga. So I'd recommend that you go to a local library, sit down, have a look through those shelves, see what's compelling, and go from there. Not much of a help, I'm so sorry. Next, from JB Subscribes, we're gonna get deep for a moment. My question is, what person, real or fictional, do you admire the most as an individual who lives, or did live, a full, joyous, and honorable life? Full disclosure, this is a selfish question because I'm gathering names of wonderful humans to counteract my despair over the mess my country is in at the moment. And I think this is a wonderful question and it really made me think. I'm going to go with somebody real life. It's my grandmother. She immigrated to the United States as a baby and um, she grew up in the US and she did so many things that were just kick-ass for the era she was doing them in. She worked at a draftsman at a company like that had huge factories and was making all kinds of industrial parts. And the story that always gets told about her is that she found a million dollar mistake that somebody had you know, written into the blueprint something or other and she realized that it wouldn't work and that because she caught it, she saved the company a million dollars, which would be a lot. And I'm pretty sure this was back in the 40s. This would have been a lot of money. And they were like so thankful that she found the mistake. And just like, that's how awesome she was. She went on to have kids, raise a family and just be able to do everything. I remember her as an amazing cook. Uh, she was super duper crafty. She sewed, she taught me how to knit. And unfortunately she passed when I was 11. So I didn't get to know her as much as I wanted but she was awesome and she was a romance reader. Yeah, just the full package. Hannah's Books asks, is there a character you especially identify with or who you feel shaped your identity in some way? And yeah, Anne of Green Gables. I read those books at the exact right time and like I wanted to be Anne or be friends with Anne and Diana and to just like live in that world that was just a little bit simpler but everyone had the same problems, you know, that you do now and that was a huge influence on me. Berna's Bookish Adventures asks, Japanese horror books and films are huge in many parts of the world. What do you think about them? And I don't really do horror. That's a bit too scary for me. I have seen a couple of the movies, um, Battle Royale, and I, ended, I saw in college, and I ended up liking that enough that where I picked up the book because uh, I wanted to see how the book was in comparison to the movie. They were both scary. And Battle Royale 2 is nowhere near as good as the first one. But yeah, I'm not big into horror. Jen at Remembered Reads asks, when you buy eBooks, do you use accounts that are based in Japan, the US or elsewhere? Do you buy through Amazon or iTunes? Do you have accounts that are for both countries or other countries to buy things on different release dates? So I have an Amazon account in the US as well as one in Japan. And the thing is, Japanese ebooks aren't that big of a thing, and it's usually cheaper for me to buy papers, especially if I can get it secondhand, so that's what I'll do. So I use my US account for any other things that I may want. I do try and buy from the publisher as much as possible, and I'm lucky enough to get eARCs sometimes, so I, I use those as well. But yeah, so separate accounts. Yvette at Book Cave asks, is there anything you miss about living in the US, both bookish and non-bookish? And definitely, when I'm in Japan, I miss stuff about the US, and when I'm in the US, there's stuff I miss about Japan. Uh, let's see, I miss good Mexican food. It's hard to find here. Indian food, no problem. Mexican food, it's thin on the ground. I miss the way that individualism is prioritized in the US sometimes, that here you have to think about how other people are going to react and how it's going to fit into other things before you do something yourself. And as far as bookish stuff, I really miss libraries. I miss libraries so much to be able to go in and browse and to just find something completely random and try it. And if I like it, great. And if not, that's fine. It can go right back. That's not really an experience I can have here with English language books. And sometimes I think if I lived in the States, I might be eligible to get paper advanced copies, which I think would be kind of cool. So yeah, even though I've never had that, I kind of miss that. Jacqueline at Six Minutes For Me asks, what are some of the differences in reading culture that you've experienced in the US and Japan? I know you've touched on things like libraries in the past, but I'd love to know more 
about anything, like how you find reading in public, bookstores, book clubs, etc. First of all, reading in public is still very much a thing here. You will see all kinds of like businessmen reading the newspaper on the morning train, as well as people reading novels or even manga on the train as well, or on the bus, just in public in general. It's not that weird. There are some major differences in bookstores, the most being that for most of the bookstores, not a, there's one major exception, but for most bookstores, the books are ordered by publisher, not by author, not by genre, not really, but by publisher. So if you want to read Murakami Haruki, and he has such a wide backlist, he has had several publishers over the decades, so you kind of have to look up who the publisher was for that particular book before you know which part of the bookstore to go to. There's this idea of tachiyomi, which is standing and reading a book without buying it, which is a thing, and it's usually in convenience stores. Somebody will kind of flip through a magazine and end up reading the whole thing right there in the store, then putting it back on the shelf. Some places have rubber band type things that they put over the magazines so that you can't do that. Likewise, stores that sell manga will often shrink wrap it so you can't do that. But in other places it's seen as very accepted and normal, especially the secondhand bookshops. Some people I think go there on their lunch hour and just enjoy flipping through manga uh, because whenever I go there at lunch that seems to be what I see. Nick MD asks, do you have a favorite medical character slash personality from the medical nonfiction and medical mangas you read? I'm going to go with a real person, Dr. Judy Melnick. She is a forensic pathologist and she started her training in New York City at the medical examiner's office two months before 9-11. And so she was right in the middle of that doing autopsies. And this book is so interesting in that it shows you all like the cool neat cases that you want to hear about you know when you're doing this you know how did this guy die kind of stuff little things like um what to expect if you are left alone with a pet after you die and what a dog will do and what a cat will do and how they're different i love how clear-eyed she is and how much she embraces the other half of her job that isn't the science but um, talking with grieving families and you know telling what she thinks happened and going through that whole side and so she has a really clear divide in her head like there's this medical stuff over here but this is how you translate it for people without a medical background and I just thought that was really good there were so many stories in here that I loved she's the kind of person that I would just love to meet I'm sure she has a bunch more stories and it's my favorite book by a forensic pathologist so far Kara at Wild Book Garden asks Okay, this is a little silly, but the question I've been wondering for a while now, what is the background at the end of your videos? Is it a photo you took? It looks like such a cool bookstore, and I'm so sorry to disappoint, but it's a stock photo. There's a website called unsplash.com, and they have all kinds of photos that are completely free of copyright, and some of the uh, creators would like uh, some name recognition, but otherwise there's nothing holding you back from transforming or using the photos in any way, so I grabbed that and used that. Priscilla at Bookie Charms asks, which book or books would you consider your legacy? I.e. books that viewers associate with your channel. What do you love most about being a reader online? So I don't know if I feel like there's one particular book where I've been like an advocate, like everyone must read this. Uh, and I think also because I read so widely and people may be here watching for several reasons, whether you like the romance, whether you like the nonfiction, whether you like the random fiction, that I don't f feel like there's one particular book that I consider my legacy. It's kind of like I consider all this wide, different stuff kind of a legacy, even though legacy feels like such a strong word. And for what I love most about being a reader online is being able to connect with people, to have conversations, to make wonderful friends on here that I can either meet in real life, I've met a couple people in real life that I can have all kinds of conversations with, and in that way my bookish life has created some very wonderful things in my more general life, especially friend-wise, and I think that's the absolute best thing. Nashua S asks, what are some books you read as a child? I'm assuming you've always been a reader, and you are correct. In addition to the ones that I mentioned before, I remember reading like some books that I had my mom's copies of. One was Caps for Sale, which is a picture book. I had her copy of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which ended up leading to Moral Dolls. Oh, I was big on the Babysitter's Club series. I had so many of those, especially the super specials, because they were much more satisfying at that more novel length than the little regular editions. Alba at Sariella asks, what is the story behind your name? How did your parents decide in favor of Kazen? And I love name stories. How is it really pronounced? 
So Kazen isn't the name that my parents gave me. It is the name I use on the internet to protect not only my privacy, but the privacy of my patients. But I have been using this name for a really long time since college. So I answer to it as if it's my name. It feels like what, like it's as if I had a nickname, you know, from a longer name to a shorter name or something. So it's not the name my parents gave me, but I can tell you how my parents chose my name because they had a hard time. They couldn't find anything that felt right until my mom was quite pregnant. And then she was watching The Price is Right and who comes down the aisle but somebody with the perfect name and she's like, that's it. So I'm named after somebody on The Price is Right. As far as pronunciation goes, it's Ka-Zen, Ka-Zen, with the emphasis being on the second syllable, Ka-Zen. And it's not cousin quite, that's probably the closest word, but it's not. And it's not Kazan either. Kazan is actually the word for volcano in Japanese, so that always makes me laugh a little bit. And it's also the name of a town in Russia, apparently. Um, but in the, also autocorrect tends to go to Kazan instead of Kazen, so I totally get that. Another way to think about it is that it rhymes with the first two syllables of adrenaline, like adren, Kazen. And last is a question from Kamari over at Surviving My 40s, and he asks, what is a random fact about you that has nothing to do with reading Japan or your occupation? So I was this close to being a theater minor in college and it wasn't for lack of want. Like I had all of the history classes that I needed and I had fundamentals of acting, acting one, acting two, and I was concentrating on the acting. But acting three was at the same time as Japanese every single semester. And it drove me nuts because I couldn't drop the Japanese because uh, that was my second major, but I was this close to having two majors and a minor. Urgh. So there we have it, the rest of the questions for the 1K Q&A. I hope you enjoyed it, and I want to thank all of you again for being here, for subscribing, for watching my videos, for commenting down below. I love talking with all of you, and I've learned so much from you. It's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience. Maybe we'll do this again at 2K. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new, and I will see you in the next video.